Hey YouTube sawdust makers, if you have a central dust collection system in your shop and are anything like me, you've had the experience of performing a machining operation and finding yourself covered in sawdust even though your collector is running. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. You finish the cut, then scan your shop and see that most of your blast gates are open, except of course the one at the machine where you're working. So I'm posting this video in case anybody's interested in seeing the shop made automatic blast gates I made for my system and how I built them. I'll show the entire build for a gate that's automatically controlled by a single phase 110 volt machine. I started by purchasing a pneumatic cylinder with a 100 millimeter stroke to operate this 4 inch blast gate. Here I'm fabricating a bracket to mount the cylinder to the side of the gate using the existing screws. This half by 1 inch aluminum angle is the first of two parts for the bracket assembly. So I think one of the biggest benefits of this build is that it's easily adapted to any size blast gate just by selecting the right length pneumatic cylinder and to any shop circuit, whatever the voltage, single or three phase. I've got these set up on four, five, and six inch gates on both single and three phase machines in my shop. This is the other part of the bracket assembly, which will attach the pneumatic cylinder to the aluminum angle. I used some inch and a quarter steel angle for this. Yeah, aluminum probably would have been plenty strong and a lot easier to work with, but I already had some of this steel angle in the shop, so I went with it. One thing a lot of blast gate automation systems do, both commercial and DIY, is to have a delay time between when a machine is turned off and when the blast gate closes to allow all the sawdust to clear from the ducts. My reasoning on why that's not necessary is that sawdust is no longer being generated once a workpiece has cleared the saw blade or knife head. Then the few seconds it takes to actually hit the off button is enough for most of the sawdust to clear. So what if a little bit doesn't quite make it? It'll get sucked up next time. So I know there are plug and play versions of this commercially available, but this method uses the gates I already have installed and is less expensive. And the plug and play ones? Yeah, well, they really aren't if you already have your dust collection system in place and have to dismantle it to install. Now I'm locating the solenoid valve, which is what controls when the pneumatic cylinder extends or retracts. Without power, air pressure is directed through one of the valve outlets and with power through the other. The cylinder can be set up as normally extended or normally retracted, simply by reversing the outlet connections to the cylinder. This one has a 12 volt BC coil, but they're available with pretty much any power input you want to use. So yeah, the first one of these I built did seem like a lot of work, but once I got that prototype figured out, it of course got easier. I made a list of everything I needed, bought all of my materials, and mass produced the rest of them. I think about 12 in total. Yeah, it was still a bit of work. But this kind of stuff is always way more fun to me than spending all my time building cabinet boxes. Okay, so the solenoid valve comes with three quick connectors for air hoses and two little brass exhaust mufflers, but not the little brass mufflers you see here. The ones here are adjustable exhaust mufflers and were purchased separately. The little screws on the tops are the adjusters. You'll see later how they're used to control the speed of the pneumatic cylinders. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'm using way too much Teflon tape on these. Sorry, I'm a carpenter, not a plumber. This is 6mm OD, 4mm ID polyurethane hose. I bought this in a kit that came with 10 meters of hose, some miscellaneous fittings, and a tubing cutter that turned out to be a lot handier than a utility knife. As I added these gates to the rest of my shop, though, I ended up needing a lot more hose and a lot more fittings. So with the bracket finished, I'm mounting the pneumatic cylinder and solenoid valve to the blast gate, and then starting to work on linking the motion of the cylinder's actuating rod to the gate itself. So how much did it cost to build this blast gate controller? You know, I generally don't bother much with the accounting for these kinds of projects. For this one, I figured out how I thought I could do it, priced out the primary components, and knew immediately that, one, I would save money, two, I could make it work with my existing blast gates, and most importantly, three, it was going to be fun to do. That said, I probably have less than 500 bucks into it for a total of 12 blast gates, so 40-ish bucks a piece. 
I'm using some 3 quarter by 3 quarter inch aluminum angle for this linkage piece. I'm mounting the link rigidly to the actuating rod and I oversized the hole on the other end of the link a little so it can have some play on the rod that's attached to the blast gate. I'm also setting the nuts on that rod to allow some back and forth play there. That allows for any difference in the travel lengths of the pneumatic cylinder and the blast gate. The momentum of the gate carries it to fully open or closed when it operates. I learned the hard way that without some play here and without the adjustable exhaust mufflers I mentioned earlier, the gate will slam open or closed and get jammed beyond its intended travel distance. With the air hoses attached, it's time to test. Looks like the adjustable exhaust mufflers need adjusting. Each valve outlet has its own exhaust port, so adjusting one of the mufflers controls the speed of the blast gate opening and the other controls the closing. This little project box will hold the current sensing switch that tells the pneumatic cylinder assembly when to open and close the blast gate. The sensing switch is really the only thing that goes in there, but I wanted it enclosed because it will need to have a hot, current-carrying wire pulled from the tool's power outlet. I'm not sure if this assembly will fly if a building inspector ever happens to walk through my shop, but I have no doubt that it would get called if there was an unprotected hot wire dangling outside of the outlet box. So I think this current sensing switch is a pretty cool little device. The way it works is that you run a hot current carrying wire through the little donut hole in the middle of it. When you turn on whatever machine it's hooked up to, current begins flowing through the wire that's going through the hole, and that creates an electromagnetic field around the wire. The switch senses that magnetic field and closes the switch, or in other words, connects whatever's attached to the K1 and K2 terminals you can see in the inset picture at the upper right of your screen. So in my case, I'll be running the hot wire from my 12 volt power supply to one of the K terminals. Then from the other K terminal, I'll run a wire to the solenoid valve at the blast gate. The negative from the power supply runs directly to the solenoid valve. So when the tool is powered on, open sesame, the blast gate opens. Whoops, maybe my step drill would be a better way to drill these larger holes through this thin brittle plastic. The metal coupling there will be used to attach this black box to the metal power outlet that the machine is plugged into and to run a wire to tie into the hot wire that supplies power to that outlet. The smaller hole with the rubber grommet is where the 12 volt DC power will enter. If you happen to notice the other hole that's opposite the top of the sensing switch, that will be to access a little adjuster on the top of the switch. The adjuster allows you to increase or decrease the sensitivity of the switch. Not something I think I'll ever need to do, but easier to drill an access hole now than after it's mounted. I have some little plastic hole caps that I'll pop in there to keep the dust and spiders out. This is the wire that will tie into the outlet that the machine is plugged into. And here's the outlet that I'll tie into to control my blast gate. The extra pigtail from the hot that you see here will allow me to wire the duplex outlet so that only one of the plugs will be used to trigger the blast gate and the other will still be available as a general utility outlet. Removing this breakaway tab between the two hot side screw terminals separates the power input between the two plugs. I don't know if it's required, but I think it's good practice to physically ground the outlet, so I'm adding the green wire to do so. My electrical system is all run through metal conduit, which is bonded at the service panel. Here, I'm wiring the hot pigtail that does not pass through the current sensor to the upper outlet, and the one that does go through the sensor and triggers the blast gate to the lower outlet. I could have done this project without having to open up the electrical outlet box at all by using a larger electrical enclosure instead of that little project box. I would have needed an enclosure large enough to install an outlet into as well as room for the current sensing switch and space for making up the wiring connections. Then also wire a cord coming out of it with a plug to plug into the existing wall outlet. But the cost of an appropriate enclosure 
an outlet and plug could easily double my materials cost, even more for some of my bigger three-phase machines. I'm pretty comfortable with most basic electrical work, so for me, this was the way to go. I've set my multimeter to check for continuity across the K terminals on the current sensing switch so I can confirm that it's functioning as planned. You can see that the switch has red and green LED indicators on its top that are telling me the same thing. Next, I need to connect some low voltage wire and run it over to the blast gate. I'll need to run my 12 volt power to the gate also. That's my power supply wire coming down from behind the metal duct. I'm connecting the supply negative directly to the solenoid and the positive to one of the wires from the current sensor. Then the other sensor wire connects to the solenoid's remaining wire. The solenoid doesn't care which wire is positive or negative, it just engages when it receives 12 volts. If it looks like there are too many wires here, you're right, my apologies. I'm actually pre-wiring a connection for another machine. So lots of systems are set up to automatically turn on a dust collector. Why didn't I do that? That was a system-based decision for my shop. I have a 10 horsepower central collector serving a dozen machines with the potential of multiple workstations being in use at any given time. It sucks a lot of amps and takes several seconds to get that 10 horse motor going so I don't really want it turning off and on every couple of minutes. I do have a few remote control switches strategically placed around my machining areas so an operator doesn't have to walk all the way over to the dust collector when it does need to be switched on or off. That said, adding dust collector switch automation would not be a big deal once you're this far. It would just require running another wire from each gate's solenoid valve back to a relay at the dust collector. I guess each line would need a diode as well so the signal from one blast gate wouldn't backfeed into and open all the others. That's pretty simple too though. I actually have one scenario in my shop that required a diode. I'll try to show that in a follow-up video. There you have it, one fully automatic blast gate. As I said, I plan to do a follow-up video to show all the variations I use to complete my system. In principle, they're all identical and just use different length pneumatic cylinders for the different size gates. I did have a couple of specific cases though where I had to get a little creative to tie into a power wire for the current sensing switch. I'll also talk about the one case that required the use of a diode and maybe a quick overview of my 12 volt electrical and compressed air supplies. Well, if you're still watching, you must have found something here useful or informative, so be sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons below. Thanks for watching.